So in this video, I want to demonstrate two key concepts of watercolor that I use all the time. Growing colored washes and drawing shadow shapes. This is not going to be a complete painting. This is just a study of a bronze head I found in a garden somewhere. I think it's in Havana, but don't quote me on that. It happens to be a bust of Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, who's a German writer, philosopher, and art critic. I'm not sure on the story behind this bust, but that's beside the point. This first part, it's, it's an underpainting. And this is that thing that I call growing the wash. You can see I'm attaching brush strokes of color together, starting from an edge and working outwards and down, building up a silhouette shape full of interesting color. I'm creating blended color variation inside the shape at the same time as making a nice sharp drawing with the outside. And that's why I work on dry paper, so I can get that sharp edge when I want to. You can see I've got a simple contour drawing underneath. This is done in a 3mm mechanical pencil with HB lead. This drawing is optional, but I find it makes for a more accurate final rendition. You can go straight in with color if you like, but the odds are you'll have a more approximate drawing. So it's up to you how much accuracy affects your happiness with the final image. Also, this is highly diluted pigment. Lots of water. Maximizes the amount of color blending and the open time before the edges dry. I don't want to have any hard shapes inside. So that's why so much water. It just gives me the most amount of time for blending. Still, you have to work briskly, joining all your strokes, trying not to let any edges dry inside, especially on a dry day, like in a desert or you know, a hot sun. Or conversely, if it's humid, especially in the tropics, it's the opposite. It's going to dry too slowly. You end up standing around waiting for your washes to dry. Sometimes I just start a second painting, or you have to go inside and find some air conditioning. So you've been watching what I'm doing here. Every time I go back for more paint, I'm changing the color. So why am I doing this? Well, first I just like the blended color, the variation. But what I'm trying to achieve is the lightest local color that's inside the object. I'm making all of the highlights that I want to show through the layers that follow. As you can see here, I'm jumping forward in time. So. Onto the second layer, the shadow shapes. But first, people always ask me about colors. So I'm using Daniel Smith turquoise mixed with Holbein's gray of gray and plenty of water and warming it up, getting that warm and cool blend with Naples yellow, uh, Daniel Smith quinacridone gold deep, and transparent red oxide. These are two alternatives for burnt sienna with a little more chroma and clarity than your typical earth color. Okay. So that was the underpainting, and the idea of growing the interesting wash. So now we're getting on to the sculpting. And of course, I've let my first silhouette dry completely before starting this second pass. When I draw these shadow shapes, I have to have complete control over what direction and how far pigment blends. If necessary, I'll use a hairdryer, or lay the painting out in the sun. So it's totally dry, and you can do this edge pulling. So you can see what I'm doing here placing these marks, drawing the dark shadow shape with a rich pigment, and I'm making the brush strokes join so the colors merge again, and then I'm cleaning my brush and pulling on the edges with clear water or even just a damp brush. This control of hard and soft is, again, it's only possible on dry paper. And I like to work systematically. Choose an important edge and work outward, knowing where I'm going to stop to make the end of the shape. You want to know which area is finished with a clean edge. Now, I do get people asking, how do you see this shadow shape? Where are the edges exactly? So let's go to another example. Here's a study of the same statue, just done in sepia ink, with a broad nib calligraphy pen, which I really enjoy drawing with. These are great fun. So in ink drawing, this is a great way to develop your ability to see the shadows, to see them as simplified, connected shapes. The ink forces you to place the shapes boldly. There's no fussing around with ink. It's immediately dark. Black ink is even more powerful, so I tend to use colored ink these days. So this is a concept from classical or academic drawing. The idea that you can mentally group all of these dark ones and compress it all into a single shape. I like to think of it like you're stamping a design over top of the silhouette. Really, the idea is to look at the shadows in the object and mentally trace them. If we look at the reference again, with a little Photoshop magic, you can see those shadows are there in nature. And you can learn to see them with a little practice. 
So back to the watercolor. Unlike that bold ink drawing with the watercolor, I can now paint these middle tones in a complex dark. Not just a black or a brown, but a combination of hues and temperature shifts, though they're all in the deeper value range. So the goal is to create this shadow shape just like it was its own grown wash. And I'm always thinking about these highlights, letting the first layer show through, just like reserving white paper, but reserving the underpainting, those lightest local colors that I laid down in advance. So can you see the similarity to the ink drawing? Except now, we can manipulate the paint, blending and smoothing. So once I've pulled an edge with a lot of water, you have to let the gradient settle, let it flow on its own and dry down to a natural gradation. I don't like to go back in and fuss with that edge. You gotta let the watercolor do its own thing. A natural transition from floating pigment will always look smoother, more perfect than you could do by hand. You have to convince the watercolor to do what you want. You can control it. The more water you use to pull an edge, the further it will travel, and the lighter it will dry. So over time, you can actually get predictable results from this kind of edge blending. It's also rare in watercolor to get a really deep tone in a single layer. After all, it is transparent. So even as I'm doing these darks, I know I'm going to have to come back. I want to get over the entire middle tones though, and then come back and hit the really dark areas a third or even a fourth time. It might look a little magical as I paint this eye, but firstly, I can still see the faint contour drawing showing through the paint and it's gradually being covered as we work. So I do have a guideline here. And I want to be honest, some things just get easier with practice. You develop a language in your painting. Everyone's eye is essentially the same structure, and with each portrait, you're just it's a matter of looking for what you need to adjust from your knowledge of an eye to fit the exact person you're painting. So I'm making it look easy, but it's just I've painted a few thousand eyes. So I've let it dry, and I'm on to the third pass, which is the darkest darks. Every watercolor is the same. You work progressively from larger to smaller, lighter to darker, and from thin or watery paint to thicker, richer pigments. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm down to the darkest darks, using more opaque paint. At the end, almost pure tube pigment. I just needed wet enough to pick it up. And that's why I like tube color, not dry pans. You have the option to work full strength. Sometimes I'll actually put down an impasto, a real blob of pigment, and I can just spread it on the page. So I'm getting down to smaller and smaller touches. It's almost a line drawing at this point. I'm making these little cast shadows, little folds in the skin. It's these last few strokes that can really change the expression of the face. So I have a lot of dark colors on my palette. Here I'm only using a few. Uh, blue, black, Daniel Smith Indigo and a true gray, which is M. Graham neutral tint. And I have a Daniel Smith convenient mix called raw umber violet, which, like it sounds, it's raw umber with a purple shade. And by the way, the brush I've been using, it's a Winsor Newton professional watercolor sable in the pointed round, which I prefer for the sharper tapered point. It's longer than the traditional round. And here's the last few touch-ups. I'll just use a moderately opaque light gray. This is that Holbein gray of gray to bring some light back into an area, like the cheekbone or the eyebrow. You can use white gouache for this mixed with watercolor, uh, or a watercolor in a titanium white, or a zinc white, which you might find sold as Chinese white. Just remember to mix it with something so these little highlights aren't too bright. So there you have it. Two fundamental skills I'm using all the time. Growing interesting washes and coming back drawing those shadow shapes.